College began in the imagination of three Brumbaugh's. They faced opposition to their idea, for they were Dunkers, and their brethren in the church feared higher education. The Dunkers were farmers who avoided the world outside their own warm fellowship. They lived simply, believed the New Testament, and did what it said. Higher education would, they were sure, corrupt their young. They were called Dunkers because they baptized by immersion, a practice their neighbors thought peculiar. Their formal name was the German Baptist Brethren. Today they are the Church of the Brethren and no longer fear higher education in the least, but then they did. And so these three Brumbaugh's proceeded cautiously. They were Dr. A.B. Brumbaugh, the first Dunker to hold a medical degree, his cousin H.B., a pioneer brethren publisher, and J.B., H.B.'s brother and assistant. Early in 1876, they asked young Jacob Zook to come to Huntington and start a school. Their offer was not lucrative. A schoolroom in the Brumbaugh print shop, free lodging, and whatever income he could get from tuition. But brother Zook agreed, and they put out the announcements. On April 17, 1876, Jacob M. Zook opened the first class of the Huntington Normal School. Only three students came. One of them was Dr. A.B.'s son. That was hardly an auspicious beginning. It was not a complete shock, though, for the Brumbaugh's had intended to begin simply. Other attempts in the Brotherhood began as grand projects and ended in foreclosure. The Huntington Brethren wanted to avoid that. Their beginning was modest and sober. And while they had not expected it to be quite that modest, they were not intending grandeur either. The founders opened with those three students and waited. Soon more students came. In less than a year, they outgrew the one room and moved to the nearby Birchinell building. Then the founders began to lay plans for a building of their own. One year later, tragedy struck. A smallpox epidemic swept Huntington. The school had to be closed and the students sent home. Professor Zook feared that this was the end of the school. It was not strong enough to survive sending the student body home midterm, but there was nothing else to do and it was done. Among the students, there were three from Ohio who knew that if they went home, they could never afford to return. They decided to stay, but there was no place to go in town, and the farmers out in the country were shunning anyone from the infected city. The only course was to flee to the mountains, and they did occupying a small abandoned cabin on Trough Creek. The weather was bitter, but they survived and even enjoyed themselves. What began as a hardship turned into an adventure and has since become a Juniata legend. The school did reopen in late February and the three refugees returned. They brought with them a youth they met in the mountains, Martin Grove Brumbaugh. In April 1879, the new building was dedicated and occupied. A faculty member remembered that the addresses that day were broadly educational, specifically historical, and deeply prophetic. That was altogether an exciting and satisfying day. Everyone felt that the little school had arrived. And then, another tragedy struck. Jacob Zook was still a young man, but he had been in poor health since his childhood. When he moved into the new building, the plaster was still wet, and the rooms were damp. He caught pneumonia and lingered for several days. Then he died. The school grieved, but it wasn't the end. Strong leaders picked up the work. Another Brumbaugh, Professor Jacob H., the doctor's brother, replaced Professor Zook, and the school went on. The trustees felt that a school with a new building deserved a president as well, and they selected Elder James Quinner. He had been an early spokesman for higher education among the brethren, and was the most prominent publisher in the Brotherhood. Everyone respected him. For nine years, he lent his name and wisdom to the school while Jacob ran it. Those Brumbaugh's with Zook and Quinter set a pattern for deliberate growth and strong leadership. They were churchmen, though, as well as good leaders. They were as concerned about their brethren faith as they were about sound education. 
From the beginning, the school was a private enterprise. For a time, it was even a stock company. The founders wanted it that way because they knew their brethren would not accept a church-sponsored school and because they believed that religious instruction belonged in the church and the home. Regular worship was required at the normal school, but the first religion course did not appear until 1882. Yet the school was clearly by brethren for brethren who wanted to give their youth good education and particularly teacher training in a brethren atmosphere. The founders wanted education and religion in the same place, but they did not want them mixed. The normal program was the heart of the curriculum. Rural Pennsylvania needed teachers, and Huntington Normal undertook to train some. In the 80s and 90s, other departments were added, music, science, and business. The school now called itself the Brethren's Normal College, and was beginning to think it might become a college. In 1893, the name was changed again to Juniata. In 1896, the charter was amended to make the institution legally a college. That year, it was recognized by the College and University Council of Pennsylvania. The next year, the school graduated its first Bachelor of Arts. Juniata was beginning to look like a college. A three-year Bible course was added to the curriculum that year. In 1899, the school even ventured into secondary education, founding an academy which trained hundreds of students for the next two and a half decades. In 1907, a school of music was added, and in 1918, that Bible course grew into a full-fledged theological seminary. The curriculum had become an astonishing variety of independent training programs. Campus activities were springing up, too. Student life in Professor Zook's day had been austere. The residents lived in boarding clubs, bought and cooked their own food. Faculty sometimes joined these clubs, and Zook belonged to one that was distinguished for its terrible burnt potato soup. The austerity of life was compensated for by the elevation of the extracurricular activity. There was only one. That was the Literary Society. It was highly esteemed and was called the Eclectic Literary Society. It began a 50-year tradition of good debate. The first intercollegiate event was, as a matter of fact, a debate in 1902. Debate dominated campus activities for many years. It was to the students then what football is now. In 1910, the debate team defeated Swarthmore and received this odd, if acid, tribute in that school's paper. There were 600 of them from Huntington, Tyrone, and the surrounding soil, all there with both feet, tin horns, and willow whistles. When they won, pandemonium broke loose. The Juniata men were carried off on the shoulders of a howling crowd of horse-throated rooters. At an earlier debate, these rooters put the victors on a wagon and went off on a wild victory parade through Huntington. There were quieter activities. Choral music began in those early literary societies, too. While it has not had as enthusiastic a history, it has had a much longer one. Intercollegiate sports began the year after debate in 1903, when Juniata hosted Susquehanna University in a track meet in June. Our team lost. After that, sports were added quickly, but the premier sport, football, came late. The trustees held out long. They simply did not want this brutal game on their campus. Pickup games were not even allowed. When Joe Landis broke his collarbone in a secret scrimmage in 1914, the trustees were grim. Their worst fears confirmed. Finally, in the fall of 1920, under intense pressure from the students, the trustees relented. The students took astonishing action. They raised $600 overnight, dispatched Roy Pee Wee Wolfgang to New York with two trunks to buy equipment, persuaded the chemistry professor Dr. Cecil to coach, turned out a squad of 25, arranged and played five games, and won one. Since that day, Juniatians have loved football. Two more Broombaws presided over the college during these years of growth. In 1893, M.G. Brumbaugh, that youth from the mountains, became the first working president. 
it was he who began to make the normal school into a college. He stayed at Juniata only three years, then took leave of absence to get his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, the first dunker to do that. He remained at Penn as professor of pedagogy, but the trustees felt he was so valuable that they kept him as president anyway, making still another Brumbaugh, his cousin I. Harvey, acting president. This arrangement continued for years while M.G. served as Commissioner of Education in Puerto Rico and then head of the Philadelphia school system. He tried to resign several times, but the trustees wouldn't hear of it. Finally, in 1911, both M.G. and I. Harvey submitted their resignations, and this time M.G. was firm. The trustees finally made I. Harvey entitle what he had been in fact. He served another 13 years as full president, 28 years in all. I. Harvey was a quiet, scholarly man who loved the classics and liked teaching better than administering. Yet he was the head of the school more years than any other man. During the last part of I. Harvey's presidency, Juniata began to sort out that bewildering array of training programs and to decide what kind of a college it would be. The president worked hard to make the school what he fondly called a right little, tight little college. The normal program and the academy were phased out. Other departments were integrated into the main curriculum. In 1922, Juniata was accredited by the Middle States Association, and by 1926, even the theological school was integrated into the four-year college curriculum. That was the Jubilee year. Fifty years of proliferated education came to an end. What Juniata lacked in academic rigor during those years, it made up for in remarkable adaptability. It tried nearly everything and then settled for being a right little tight little college.